Yahweh, we come today humbly. We don't know how you want to work this, where you're going to go with it, but I know that you're here. This is the leading that you've given us, so lead us and speak to our hearts. I pray that every one of us that came here, even those who didn't come for the right reason, I pray that you encounter you here and that they'll never be the same again. I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I can pretty much assure you that every person who has ever been called a man of God, a woman of God, for the most part, at points in their life, <laughs> yeah, I'm cheating, I'm not. Anyway, at points in their life, they wanted nothing to do with the gospel. There was a point in their life where you might have went to church on Sunday, but you really didn't, yeah, whatever. You know, when I was growing up, when we got to a age where we were supposed to go to church, you know, pretty much in those days, you were just punching the time clock. So we'd go out, really, we'd smoke a little dope, and then we would stop at church and get the missalette and come home. Ah, I went to church, and we fooled mom and dad, but we didn't fool the Lord. Well, we didn't want anything to do with it, and that's just the life we live. Finally, thank the Lord. He got a hold of this vessel. Or else I wouldn't be here today, I'm sure. I know I wouldn't be here, but I might not even be alive if it weren't for the grace and mercy of Yahweh. I want to start in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 6. And I want to share with you an encounter that the prophet Isaiah had with Yahweh, with the, with the Lord Almighty. And the interesting thing we're going to see here is as awesome as what this experience is, it wasn't the only person who ever experienced these supernatural encounters with the Almighty. And he's unchangeable. So if he encountered people yesterday, then he does today and he will forevermore. So Isaiah chapter six, this is the prophet Isaiah. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Yahweh, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to the other and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So Isaiah said, Woe is me, I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew over to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard a voice of Yahweh saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is one of the most amazing encounters of a, a vision. But was it a vision? Or did it happen? There's the question. He says, I saw the Lord. I can tell you, and I'm nobody. Remember, when I tell you these stories, I'm telling you things that I've encountered, but I'm not saying this to say that I'm somebody special. I'm not. That's the whole awesome thing. You don't have to be somebody special. You're special to the Lord. But you don't have to be Moses. You can just be you who hungers for Yahweh, who hungers for Jesus, and you'll meet him some way. I was on an airplane once flying down to Florida, Tampa, Florida. I don't like in those days. I didn't care to fly because it popped my ears. I didn't know the secret of blowing your popping your ears 250 times on the airplane. So I get off a plane and my head would hurt for two hours. I didn't like flying. So I'm flying down there and I'm reading the word. And actually I was listening to Smith Wigglesworth's sermons also. And I was kind of belly aching. I hate flying. Why do I got to go down here? It was for business. 
And I looked out the window and I saw, you know, when you get above the clouds, you've flown before, it's like a whole other world up there, you know. There's no darkness in the clouds, they're pure white. And I saw a vision of Jesus sitting on a huge throne with a purple robe and a scepter in his hand. I could see everything. He was huge. I couldn't see his face. And there was no more belly aching after that. The whole trip was changed. He showed me how real he is. Over the years, he showed me, I'm here. I am Yahweh. I'm Jesus. I'm the one who died for you. If you would seek after him, you will have these encounters. I promise you will. Not everybody dreams. I dream a lot. I've had some interesting, I have a journal at home that sometimes I'll go to read it and I'll think, man, who is this guy that has one? Then I think, well, you knucklehead, it's just you. P is a personal, personal God. He loves you. That's what's so awesome. So Isaiah has this amazing encounter and when he had the encounter, what happened? He said, woe is me, I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. When you encounter holiness, it shows you your blackness, your hatred, your wickedness. And so when you have those things like looking out of a plane window, you think, oh Lord, and you wanna live a whole new life. You wanna live a life that honors him, that pleases him. And I want you to know the, the, what I feel. I want you to know the joy, the hope that I know. That's what you need to know. That's why I'm here, is just to share with you these things. But it wasn't just Isaiah. I want to share with you a number of encounters that people had in the Bible with Yahweh and with Jesus. Adam and Eve saw God in the visible after they had sinned. Well, they hid themselves from him. He's walking in the cool of the garden. They're hiding from him. He's there in the garden with them. When they sinned, they blew that. See, when we get to heaven, he's going to be there with us in heaven. And here, we're going to be here reigning with Christ for a thousand years with him. Hallelujah. Amen, sis. Cain. It says here, Cain saw God in visible form. This is from Genesis chapter 4, 6, 9, and 16. For he could not have been driven out of the invisible presence, which is with everyone, everywhere. He's everywhere. But there are times when he, God, should, said, leave. He banished him. Yahweh banished him. Then you have, it says here in Genesis eleven five, 5, Yahweh appeared on earth at the time of the Tower of Babel, for the word says, Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower. Oh, here he goes. Pull that beard. That's when my grandkids do that. Don't do that like Santa Claus. Abraham. Abraham was blessed with several appearances. The first one's recorded in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham. The Lord appeared to Abram. Abram. He wasn't Abraham yet. Isn't that amazing? He is amazing. He is not this God that is untouchable, unapproachable. He is one that loves us so much that when he could not touch us because of our sin, he came up with a way before the foundation of the world that he would send his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so that what Adam and Eve did in the garden could be banished, it would be done away with. And now there's no more block. The word says Yahweh cannot look at sin, but when, when we're in Christ Jesus, we're not in sin. So Yahweh now can see me as my, as my Abba. I can't see him yet, but I will someday. 
But if he chose to show himself, he could do anything he wants. In Genesis chapter 17, 1 through 22, the Lord appeared to Abraham and got up, God went up from Abraham. It says in Genesis 18, 1, that Yahweh appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre. Verse 2 says, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. Most believe that this was two angels, and many believe that was Jesus, the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? What, did he get a good look at you, man? Don't you love family? Isn't it amazing? And Genesis 18 proves a visible appearance. He said, let, this is Abraham speaking, let a little water be brought and wash your feet. Then he took butter and milk and the calf which had been prepared and he set it before them and they ate. The men arose from there and looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And Yahweh said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, I will now go down and see for myself. I will go down and see. He's personal. I'm, I want you to know that who he is and who he was yesterday, he is today. And who he is today, he'll always be. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's unchangeable. He's God. This just blesses me because we say, well, yeah, but that's Abraham. Yes, it was Abraham. But you think about Peter and Paul and these guys. Matthew, the tax collector. Nobody, ordinary guys. This is like Jesus came down and grabbed you 12. Okay, you 12, come on. And when you say yes to him and he sets you apart, he sanctifies you, you become, he, taint, he changes you from a sinner to a saint. He'll change your life. He'll take you from being a mess to be a messenger for him. You don't have to be born in, a, in wealth. You don't have to be born with a big name. You just have to say yes. And you have to surrender your life to him totally. Yahweh appeared to Isaac and confirmed the Abrahamic code with him, as it is clear in Genesis chapter 26, 2 through 4, which states, Yahweh appeared to him. And again, to Isaac, reminding him of the covenant in Genesis chapter 6, he appeared to Jacob and confirmed the Abrahamic code, a covenant with him. Yahweh wrestled with Jacob in bodily form, it says. So when you're going through difficulty, don't think he can't come and say, come here, my son. Come here, my daughter. I love you so much. And he's everywhere at all times. He's, in, he's here now. This room right now is filled with heaven. There are angels in this room with us. So I've had people say over the years, man, I can't describe, there's something about that place. And I said, it's not what you can see that makes it so important. It's what you can't see that makes this place special. Because if we had eyes to see in the spirit, not a one of us would be on our feet. Where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I will be there with you. Jacob said in verse thir chapter 32, verse 30, he said, For I have seen Yahweh face to face, and my life is preserved. What a statement. See, most of us just think, well, we, we, you know, and you can. I mean, I, I, if, when Moses, and he's next, come upon the bush that was burning, First thing that happened is he put his head down. I, I know I'm quite sure I would too. And Yahweh said, to Moses, take the shoes from off your feet, for the ground that you are standing on is holy ground. 
I'm here to declare to you today that the ground that we are standing in here now is holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. Church, to some people, is a club. A relationship with Christ is a lifestyle. It's, a, it's your life. Before you're anything else, that's who you are. It's not what you are, it's who you are. Who am I? I'm a child of the King. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. I'm redeemed. I'm filled with the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. That's who you are. If you're a believer, I've encountered Him. I've never, I've never had Him come and served Him a meal, but I hope someday He stops by my mansion in heaven and lets me cook him up something good. The Lord appeared to Moses again in a flaming fire in the midst of the bush. This is one of many instances where it says the angel of the Lord is used for Yahweh himself. Whereas in Exodus chapter 3 verse 2 it says the angel. Verse 4 then it says the Lord saw. So oftentimes it says the angel of the Lord but then he says I will. He's speaking as first person. The angel speaking for Yahweh. So was it an angel? Was it a messenger? Was it, again, Jesus? Joshua encountered the captain of Yahweh's army. Again, some think that was the same messenger who came to Abraham. Moses saw Yahweh on Mount Sinai, face to face, Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. He said he saw him face to face, Exodus 33, 9 through 11. We read of God talking with Moses as he entered into the tabernacle. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Even the heathen have knowledge of this meeting between Moses and God. Amazing. Do the unbelievers have knowledge of your relationship with Yahweh? Do unbelievers know that you walk with the living God and that the living God walks with you? That you read his word, that you worship him face to face? You might not be able to see him, but I truly believe that when you go to really worship, I believe that we're just, just taken right into the presence taken right into the throne room. Have you ever worshiped the Lord at home on your face on the ground and just laid there knowing full well whose presence you're in? He's awesome. Some of you think I'm crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm as sane as I've ever been. Exodus 33, Moses asked Yahweh to see his glory. Instead of his bodily form set apart from his glory, which he had already seen many times, it says, but Yahweh refused to show him his glory and expressed in his face, but Moses might see it as he expressed it, but he let him see him walk by. He let him see his hinder parts. Honestly, I don't know that the scripture's saying, and I don't believe it is, that Moses was looking face to face with Almighty Yahweh. I don't, I just don't know that we could stand it. But I think he was there, protecting, just like he's protecting us here in his presence. Why is it that every time in the Bible when somebody sees an angel, they freak out? Because they're awesome. Angels are not like God. Angels are not like Jesus. Angels are not like Yahweh. Say. Yahweh appeared to Moses and all, listen to this, he appeared to Moses and all Israel at the, as recorded in Leviticus chapter 9, which says fire came out from before, not down from, from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. This indicates a, a visible presence. 
He was there. You heard about Elijah calling down fire from heaven. I'm telling you, there's not a problem that we face. Our problem is not social justice. Our problem in America is sin. Our problem is sin. We are a sinful nation. We are full of corruption. And we're rotting at the core. And we don't have... We don't have... Christ the way I believe people did in the old days. Even in America in the early days. Even in the 50s and the 60s. The 60s started getting wild. But somewhere... I mean, do you know when... America was young. Children were taught how to read by reading the Bible. Did you know that? That was their reading book. There was no separation of church and state. We were a Christian nation, but we're not a Christian nation anymore. But the one who I'm speaking of, he's still saying, I am going to come into your life if you will invite me in, if you will Surrender your life to me. I will become part of your life. I will become part of your family. I will be become part of your everything. He's the most important to me. My wife has told people, now soon we're going to be doing a wedding here, and I haven't had a chance to talk to her and her husband-to-be yet, but there's three people got to be involved in a wedding. And that's him, her, and him. And if he's not part of it, I don't think things are going to go well. My wife, I remember years ago, she was talking to her sister on the phone, and she said emphatically, I'm not the most important person to Steve. And I mean, she wasn't complaining. She was making a matter of fact. She comes in second to God. That takes nothing away from her. She's the best. But God, Yahweh, is God. No person, not even children and grandchildren, can fill that place in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses was 120 years old at the time of his death, and it said, that the Lord appeared to him. Numbers 22, 20, Yahweh appeared to Balaam at night and to instruct and warn him. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn. There he is again. That, that Jesus that's going to come back the next time, he's not coming back as a baby, he's coming back as a warrior. He's coming back with a sword. He's got a sword in his hand, a scepter in his hand. He's coming back to kick some behind. He's not happy. He shouldn't be happy. We have offended a holy God. We've done things in the name of religion, and there is going to literally be hell to pay. But for the children of God, it's going to be a reunion like never before. I mean, I can't wait to see some of our loved ones who've gone before us, but I can't wait to see Jesus first because he's the one who died for me. And then to get to that throne to see Yahweh, whew, my goodness, I'm telling you guys, I really think Jesus is going to be the first one you see. I really do for some reason. And I could just say, come on, let me take you to my dad. Glory, glory, glory. Numbers 23, 16 through 24, Yahweh met Balaam and put a word in his mouth. Joshua saw God in the visible form having a sword drawn in his hand. And he had received a word when Joshua fell on his face to the earth to worship. This proves that this wasn't an angel. You don't worship angels. We worship Yahweh. We worship Jesus. He appeared to Manoah's wife and predicted Samson's birth. 
I just had read that recently. Manoah, another one. Manoah's wife's barren, no children. Yahweh is the God who opens the womb so many times. So many of the men of, the great men of the Bible, they came from barren wombs that God spoke life into. That's what happens when you come to him and your life is barren. He can speak life into your death. Into your dead life, he'll give you life. A new life. A life of hope and joy and peace. Let me just give you a couple others. Yahweh appears to Samuel, the little boy. He's sleeping. And he hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel runs into the priest, Eli, and says, here I am. I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed. And he hears Samuel, Samuel. Here I am. I didn't call you, boy. Go back to bed. Then it happened a third time. Samuel, Samuel. This time, Eli had sense to know, if I'm not calling him, somebody's calling him. So if you hear the voice again, say, speak, Lord. Your, your servant is listening. He was a little boy, and he heard the voice. Samuel, here I am, Lord. Your servant is listening. And Samuel became one of the great prophets and judges of Israel all time. He was there. The Lord appeared to Gideon as he sat under, sat under a terebinth tree. He's called the angel of the Lord again. So many places he's called the angel of the Lord, but he's speaking on the Lord's behalf. So sometimes you just see he's there, but you know what? I'd be quite happy if an angel of the Lord came knocking on my door. But I don't need him to. I don't need her to. I know. And he speaks to my heart. You know, last night I had nothing. Nothing. I was watching the UFC. I went up to get some food. I'm coming downstairs, and the Holy Spirit put on my heart. Take a look at Isaiah 6. I go to Isaiah 6, and then I find these notes. It's just, I don't sit and sweat on what to bring you because I'm too stupid to know what to bring you, so I just leave it up to him. Even if it comes to Sunday morning, there are times I don't even know what I'm going to speak until Sunday morning. But he's proven that you belong to him. You don't belong to me. How can I know what you need to hear? But he knows what you need to hear because he knows everything about you. He knows your past, your present, and he definitely knows your future. And I pray that your future involves him. Let's go to the New Testament. Well, no, there's one good one here, of course. A couple of them, but Job. Job 42, 5. Yahweh appeared to Job and said, I have heard you, but now my eyes see you. God appeared to Isaiah, which we already read that. Amos declared, I saw the Lord standing by the altar. Isn't that awesome? These are the Old Testament prophets. And then, of course, Acts. Stephen, the servant of God, the very first martyr the church has ever known. He loved Jesus. He was saved by the grace of Jesus. He was filled with the Spirit of God. And because he told the Jewish people that they were stiff-necked, and they were, that they always killed the prophets, which they did, and they took him out and they stoned him to death. And while Stephen was between here and there, the Bible says he looked up and he said, look, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the power. Hallelujah. Who was Stephen? He was a waiter. He was a waiter. <laughs> you know who he was? They wanted someone to serve tables so the apostles didn't have to do it. So they chose Stephen in, in seven. There were seven. Stephen, he was a waiter. In the, whole, in the Old Testament, you had to have the Holy Ghost just to wait tables. Nowadays, I think there's people in the pulpit don't have the Holy Ghost. There's something wrong. And then John, the apostle. He saw both Yahweh and the glorified Christ in the reception of the revelation. You see the appearance of Christ, the seven golden lampstands, all the things. I'm just saying all this to let you know that this God of ours, although he's mysterious, he's not a mystery. 
No one who loves you as much as he does will make it difficult for you to know him. Would that make sense? Our problem is, is we don't want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him more than I've ever wanted to know him, and I want to know him more. And I don't care how long, if I lived for a thousand years, I wouldn't know him because he's, un, he's unsearchable. But that doesn't mean I'm not gonna try. The Apostle Paul, he was near his death. He was gonna be beheaded. Both Paul and Peter were murdered in Rome for their faith. His beheading was coming close and, and he wrote, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I think to myself, every time I read that, I think, man, if Paul didn't know him, who did? But yet he was saying the depth of him. I want to know more of him. I want to know more of him. He wants you to know him. Years ago, the Holy Spirit said to me, there is a place in me that I want you to go. But most people won't go there. They just won't go there. Why? Because we want our stuff first. We want me. If, if it's about me, if my journey is for Steve, I'm not going to find him the way he wants to be found. He promised in the scripture, if you search for me with all your heart, you'll find me, but not half-hearted. Sunday Christians is not what he's looking for. He's looking for transformed Christians. He's looking for people who've given him their lives, who say, Lord, whether I live or die is totally up to you. What I do from this day forward, where I go is totally up to you. I have no say-so in the matter. You are my king and I am your servant. When you have that relationship, that's, that's when he begins to knock on your door. That's begin, he starts to rap on your window. He begins to show you things. You, I mean, I could just go on and on about things I've seen in dreams. And again, I'm not special. I'm as ordinary as anyone can ordinarily be. But I've been searching for him. I'm hungering for him for 35 years. Sometimes when I see a mountain lion searching for its prey, that focus that a cat has, that's how I want to be for the Lord. I just want to have focus. Do you know doves are a monogamous animal, bird? That's why they say love birds. They're always doves. They're monogamous. They would love only one. They only have eyes for one. Yahweh wants us to have eyes for him. And I promise you, he has eyes for you. So I, I hope that you see from these scriptures and these stories in the Bible, it's all true. If you're not enjoying a relationship with the Almighty, it's because you're not putting anything into it. No marriage is going to succeed if only one partner is working. But if you begin to pursue him, I'm telling you. Now, Roger Curry is one of the most dear brothers I've ever known. And I'm not going to try to embarrass you. But I wouldn't say that this guy is a radical. Like when I first got to Calvary, I think they thought I was a radical. But Roger is a radical. He just doesn't have as big a mouth as I do. But he, he can tell you some stories of things he's seen God do, miraculous things, because he knows who he is. So, brothers and sisters, I want you to be saved. There's no question about that. I want you to be saved because Yahweh wants you to be saved. Jesus paid for your sins on the cross. Come to Christ, be saved. But what he really wants is a relationship with you here on earth that will continue into eternity. Man, you're on target today, sis. <laughs> this relationship, you could come to Christ Jesus today and for the rest of your existence, which will be never-ending, you can be best friends with the Almighty. He is my best friend, but he's a lot better friend than I am. But I want to be a better friend. That's why I search the scripture. That's why I read the word. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know what he thinks. I want to know what he feels. 
I want to know what hurts him and I want to know what makes him happy. I want to be pleasing to him. I want to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I called you to do. I don't just want to get to heaven because Jesus died on the cross. I take nothing away from that. But so many of us, we accept our salvation and then we just continue to live selfish lives. Jesus did not die for the selfish. Selfishness is not, cannot be a description of a follower of Jesus Christ. No way. And if you have selfishness in your life, you need to go talk to daddy, father, and say, please remove that from me. And anything that's in my life that offends you, that, that you don't like, please remove it from me. I've been praying that prayer for 35 years. And if I live for another 50 on this earth, I'll keep saying, Lord, please keep removing this stuff in my life that does offend you. Make me pleasing in every area of my life. I've always believed that you know you're on the right track when it comes to him. That when you're alone, you're the same as you are when you're in the midst of a crowd. If this is how I am here, and that's how I am when nobody's looking, God's done a work in that life. We can all put on our Sunday faces, but what's going on when nobody's looking? It's just this intimacy, intimacy between him and us. So if you want to know him as your Savior and Lord, I pray you come to him today. I really do. And if you already know him and you're not experiencing this relationship, I pray that you would give him everything. Give him your heart. Give him your life. This ain't a religious thing. This is a reality. Someday, this is all going to be over with. I'm about ready to close. And there's going to be some of us in this room that are going to be in heaven. And sadly, there are going to be people in this room, quite sure, that won't be in heaven. They're going to be in hell. Because they refuse to listen. When he constantly said, come to me, I love you, I love you, I love you. That we, ah, but I know better. I know better. Or when I, when I get older, I'm going to get more serious about God. When I get my life in order, I'm gonna get serious about God. When my kids are raised, I'm gonna get serious about God. People, it don't work that way. Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Give him your heart today. He gave you his when he gave you Jesus. He gave you his best. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just pray as your spirit invades this room and invades our hearts, that you would just move on people in this room. I know they feel you. I know they know you're here. But those who have fought against you and run away from you, I pray, Lord, that there'll be nowhere else to run. I pray that they will turn and surrender and that they would experience the joy of Yahweh. And that a relationship with you would become the most important relationship of their life. It'll make them better husbands, better wives, better fathers and mothers, better grandparents, better friends, better people, better neighbors. Have your way in our lives and we bow to give you praise in Jesus' name. Judy's going to come up and sing a song and then we're going to have our communion. I want you to know that God loves you guys. I'm telling you, he loves you so much that he even, I'm talking about the indescribable comes down to us. Glory indeed. So let's listen to this wonderful song and then I'm going to share communion with you and we'll send you on your way. Hallelujah.